Okay, here we have out six slabs of 99.9% .9 pure bismuth, roughly 180 pounds worth. Right at about current value of $4,200 worth of pure bismuth and a neodymium 2 inch by 2 inch by 1 inch. Obviously, there's a break in between each one of these 33 pound slabs. There is a spatial limiter where the bismuth breaks with itself and you have an air gap, however small. So, we should notice a differential of uh, action dragging it along the six bars, either along the dielectric inertial plane, one way, or along the centrifugal divergent magnetism, which is dominant on either polarized side, although there is a centripetal point of attraction of dielectric inertia. And then we'll make a quick explanation of dielectric inertia, although that's hardly possible. That will have to be reserved for the book, as per the Poincaré disk model of uh, representation of dielectrical inertia. So, let's see what we get, as if I haven't done this test already. Dragging along centrifugal divergent magnetism. There's six. You obviously cannot see it, but I can assure you it's here. All you have to do is grab yourself 180 pounds of bismuth, 180 pounds of bismuth and see for yourself. What happens is you'll notice, you can't see it, but it's like running across uh, five different speed bumps. The centrifugal magnetism breaks along one, two, three, four, five between the slabs where there is actually a spatial break between the 33 pound slabs of bismuth, so it's like hitting five speed bumps. So, we do it the other way along the centripetal dielectric inertial plane. We should notice the inverse. Instead of five speed bumps, we should notice five dips, or potholes if you will, where there is a breaking point of attraction or dielectric avoidance. So, is it there? Instead of five speed bumps, do we have five potholes, for lack of a better analogy? Yes, we do. Why, it's right there. Sure enough. Yes, that's correct. So, what is dielectrical inertia? Explaining that in a little video is well nigh impossible, so unfortunately, they give a little analogies. So, let's presume this little Torah flux is dielectric inertia, and it is infinitely thin. The interatomic of every atom, depending on the harmonic of the atom, whether it's iron or bismuth, with extremely high dielectric inertia, the highest elemental dielectric inertia, we have uh, dielectricity and magnetism. It is the dielectro, uh, magnetodielectric interatomic volume of every atom. This would be dielectricity. This would be occurring instantly at superluminal speeds, at various axis points, so I'm only representing one plane here. So dielectricity and dielectricity in discharge. You see? Magnetism. Dielectricity. Magnetism. Dielectricity. So I'll have to explain in volume 3 and in volume 4 really, edition 4 of Uncovering the Missing Secrets of Magnetism, why magnetism, the most natural and innate form of radioactivity, of radiation, not radioactivity, but a radiation. Why it must return upon itself. Why not, like every other form of uh, radiation, does uh, magnetism not just go out and stay out, like uh, alpha particle emissions and gamma and beta? Why does magnetism have to reciprocate centripetally to the other side? Why doesn't magnetism just go out and stay out? Well, the answer is actually so divinely simplex and yet at the same time so incredibly hard to enumerate why, but it really is very simple. Um, loss of inertia and discharge necessitates spatial vectorization and return to centripetal voidance at the opposite polarity for reintegration at which, through spatial divergence and vectorization, the increase, the reinitialization, the reacquisition of the dielectrical inertia as represented as the ether modality of magnetism is re-accelerated, for lack of a better analogy, in short not that I don't have a better analogy, but just to make it short and sweet dielectricity, magnetism, spatial vectorization, reintegration in other words, if you were to have 
500 people running in a pack centripetally. Centripetal convergence, dielectricity. Just imagine this as infinitely thin dielectrical inertia pointed, directed at, concentrated at the center, a null point vulcrum of inertia, which you cannot see here, obviously, since this is just a three dimensional representation of a two dimensional premise of an ether modality in inertia. That loss of inertia necessitates, if we were to imagine, obviously I cannot just show you one vector using a Toro flux, but let's just imagine, I think there's 15 radial elements on this. Let's just imagine the loss of that inertia undergoing spatial vectorization and for its reacquisition to maintain ether stasis. Just like fluid dynamics, all is pressure mediation, all is field pressure mediation, spatial vectorization, reintegration, just like slinging a stone out from a null point vector through spatial, uh, through spatial vectorization, increase its speed for reassimilation, centripetal convergence. So, there is conservation of the ether. That is why magnetism, a magnet, is obviously, as I've stated before, a thousand times is a dielectric object with resultant centrifugal divergent magnetism. It is a coherent, either by increased capacitance or by increased coherency by mere magnetic induction of the dielectricity within the magnet, either created through increase of dielectric capacitance or increase of coherency of dielectricity from magnetic induction, which makes dielectricity fields act upon fields. Magnetism, like I said, does not attract anything. It orders things and causes dielectric coherence through ordering. Magnetism only repels. There is no such thing as magnetic attraction. Only dielectric voidance and countervoidance. Obviously what is operating through space is magnetism, but what it causes is dielectric coherence and voidance. So, now let's imagine our dielectric inertial plane undergoing coherence by increasing its capacitance or bringing it into coherency. Now you'll notice before when I could cause special vectorization, here we have complete coherence. Obviously this being a steel Toro flux, you see I can't lift it up now? That's right. That's, that's your little analogy for dielectric inertia. I can't raise it up. I can't expand my Toro flux. Now let's remove the magnets. This is a steel Toro flux here. It was undergoing magnetic induction, which is also causing coherency of the dielectric inertia within the steel atoms, the iron atoms of this uh, steel uh, little toy, basically a Toro flux. There we go. So I couldn't do that with a magnet bringing the steel under induction would not raise. We were thinking, well, that's just because the magnet was detracting it, it wouldn't let it raise. Well, that's true descriptively, but that's not true explicatively. Explanations are not descriptions and vice versa is not the case also. We need explanations in life. The world is full of descriptions. It is devoid of explanations. So, see the difference? That versus this little kit. Boom. That is dielectric inertia in short. Unfortunately, explanation of it in short is rather impossible, even though it is an extremely simplex principle. So, now you have to ask yourself the question, what is the difference between copper and bismuth? I'm not touching the copper. What is the difference? Obviously, if this copper weighed 33 pounds like these slabs, I wouldn't be able to move it either. But the bismuth reacts differently because the bismuth has extremely low, the lowest magnetic permeability, i.e. extremely high magnetic reluctivity. Copper, you can try this yourself at home with a large neo. You have as much quote-unquote attraction as you do repulsion. Attraction and repulsion are only descriptions. They're not explanations. What is going on is dielectric voidance or dielectric countervoidance. The reason we're able to use a magnet against copper winding coils and get electrification, phi times psi equals Q Planck electrification. Remember, electricity is a hybrid ether modality. You cannot have electricity without dielectricity and magnetism. The two necessary 
absolute components of electrification are dielectricity and magnetism not one or the other but both and always both electricity does not exist without those two components okay understood remember electricity does not terminate into magnetism but terminates as magnetism by losing its dielectric component since we know electricity is dielectricity and magnetism both Electricity, speaking of electromagnetism, quote unquote, is incorrect. Electricity terminates as magnetism, not into magnetism. Electricity is both dielectricity and magnetism. The discharge of electricity, like say a large, um, a large lifter magnet, a large electromagnet for lifting up car junk out of the scrap yard, the electricity terminates into a coil, a large electromagnet, it loses its dielectric component and it discharges and what is left is enormous amount of magnetism which lifts up that steel, the steel scrap. So, copper, silver, um, some other metals are obviously great quote unquote conductors, but the conductors are not really conductors. You can read that from Eric Vidala, The Fallacy of Conductors. Type in a Google search, The Fallacy of Conductors by Eric P. Dollar. He's got the only accurate description of a quote unquote conductor. It's just the inverse. Superconductors are actually super repulsors. Uh, superconductors are actually super diamagnetic. They are have extremely high magnetic reluctivity. The same as bismuth. Bismuth basically is a room temperature quote-unquote superconductor, but a superconductor is not a superconductor. A superconductor is a super high magnetic reluctive object either due to being supercooled or like our bismuth here, extremely high dielectric inertia. In other words, bismuth will not let in magnetism disturb its inner atomic magneto dielectric volume it will not do it the only thing that will ruin bismuth is by shooting it with neutrons high energy neutrons which convert into protons so you add one proton to bismuth and you create insanely dangerous insanely radioactive polonium so you go from the super super stable element to something that will assassinate your ass with one one millionth of one gram that's all it takes to kill you and kill you horribly no less one millionth of one gram just by adding one proton remember bismuth is the end product of neptunium i think the half-life of neptunium is twelve point something million years so early creation of the earth there's enormous amounts of uranium and who knows how much of plutonium since it all degrades into lead but Bismuth is right on par with gold and platinum in its rarity in parts per billion in the Earth's crust. And we know that bismuth did not exist as a primordial element in the Earth or probably in any planetoid, but only exists as the end product of Neptunium in discharge. Neptunium is the only element also, by the way, that would not need to be refined. It would have to be pure, but it wouldn't have to be a specific isotope. Any form of Neptu pure Neptunium uh, with sufficient mass is enough to create an atomic device. That uh, secret revelation was released by the Department of Energy in 2002, I believe, but I could be wrong on that date. But anyway, they released the fact that Neptunium in its pure form, which Neptunium is the first transuranic element. In other words, it's the first element above uranium. Right after Neptunium is plutonium. The thorium, uranium, plutonium, um, those heavy elements always terminate into the creation of lead ultimately, but only one thing terminates ultimately and finally into bismuth 209, and that is neptunium. Very, very interestingly, like I've already just said, neptunium is the only element in pure, purified form, not a specific isotope, but any neptunium in its purified form as its first transuranic element is fissionable into an atomic nuclear device. Very interesting. And neptunium resultantly, in and through radioactive decay, terminates as this. In other words, millions and millions of years ago, all of this bismuth would have been neptunium. And what sits before me here, if I were able to collect it about 12, 
collected about 12 million years ago would have been about, oh, I don't know. I think, I can't remember what the critical mass of Neptunium is, was released by the Department of Energy, but something, there's something here about uh, 12 or 13 nuclear devices right here in front of me. I mean, he knows how many megaton he yield, but this is what it terminated into over the past millions and millions of years. Interesting information, nerdy, geeky information. So this whole video was a very, very short introduction of dielectric inertia. What is it? Why is it? You have to ask yourself, why is magnetic radiation unlike any other radiation? Why must it reconverge itself centripetally on the other side or along the dielectric inertial plane? Why? is magnetic radiation unlike alpha, beta, gamma, and other radiations which just goes out and stays out. Magnetism reciprocates as because dielectricity operates along the Poincaré disk model. Perfect explanation, although understanding it is not simplex. It is simple, but it's very complicated. I understand it perfectly. I've got a perfect image of it in my head. Typing it out so other people can understand it, that however is a different matter. So, see we got nothing here. Magnetic induction, dielectric coherency, I can't lift it up. Get that? This would be our analogy of the dielectric inertial plane. All charge necessitates discharge. Magnetism is nothing other than dielectricity in discharge where it must reintegrate through spatial vectorization and reintegration centripetally. If you understand that, well, you're a lot more advanced than most people. If you understand that, you gotta give yourself a good pat on the back because most people are not going to get that. Spatial vectorization is necessitated in dielectric discharge and reintegration centripetally to keep the system within its own conservation. All ether modalities work just like fluid dynamic lowest pressure mediation. Really rather simple. It's kind of like flushing your toilet. If your pipes don't roll downhill, it's all going to roll back into your house. All fluid dynamic pressure mediation. Nature doesn't work against your own pressures. Dielectricity, magnetism. Okay, understand it? If you understand this, you're going to really understand so, so many things. Not just in ether modalities, but understand things in life. Just everything works upon the four ether modalities. Dielectricity, magnetism, electricity, and gravity. Electricity and gravity are two hybrids of electricity of dielectricity and magnetism. So you ultimately have two fundamental ether modalities in the universe, dielectricity and magnetism, and there are two hybrid modalities, electricity and gravity. So Fun playing with four thousand dollars of the bismuth. <laughs> oh yeah, I stopped making these videos at three o'clock in the morning. Anyway, thanks for watching.